coming soon. Uh. Um, all right. So welcome everyone now for real uh, to the inaugural seminar of, of this insect uh, series. Um, so these seminars will feature fellow uh, neurobiology researchers not affiliated uh, to Harvard who are currently either in the uh, very late stages of their postdoc postdoctoral research or as in we have today have very recently uh, become independent. So overall, the goal of this program is to promote scientific exchange and the networking between the young scientists. Uh, we aim to provide a bit of a platform in which speakers can gain more scientific visibility, uh, meet established faculty, postdocs, and grad, grad students within HMS and uh, vice versa. Um, so, so we believe that also this platform will be an excellent chance for postdocs and grad students here to learn from as a successful young scientist, we, we believe that some of the speakers that we will feature uh, will actually become leaders in their respective fields of uh, research. Uh, and also to gain insight and perspective into other challenges and opportunities to become a PI now, uh, nowadays. And actually to dig deeper into, into this topic, uh, how to become a PI, we are hosting an open discussion at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, it's the same Zoom link. And during this session, we will, um, of course, also be addressing any scientific question that cannot be addressed during uh, the talk right now. I encourage all of you to uh, join us. Um, and even if this discussion was initially advertised for postdoc and grad students, any faculty that wants to uh, join to discuss science or discuss like this transition to PI is, of course, very, uh, very welcome. Uh, so INSET is an initiative of the uh, Neuro Postdoc Club. And it's organized by uh, Yasmin and Giacomo from the DMEC lab, Charlene from the RFIS lab, and myself from the Kaiser lab. And of course, we had a lot of help uh, from the department. So Janine, so hi, Jonathan, um, uh, thank you for this. This first uh, insect series will only have three uh, seminars. Uh, and they will all, of course, be virtual. So the one today, one in February, and one in March that we will later on advertise. And they all feature speakers from uh, Massachusetts institutions. And our goal eventually is to expand to uh, the whole country in future editions. So, um, and while we, we will try to acquire the means to actually you know, bring the speakers physically here to HMS for better interaction, but of course, COVID, COVID is over. And of course, to get there, we will need the support of the community. And the best way to, to support this initiative will be, of course, by attending and participating in these meetings and discussions. Uh, we're also streaming by uh, YouTube. So uh, those who are following um, by streaming, if you, know, you have any questions, just uh, uh, type a comment there. And we'll try to get uh, to it. Uh, so now I would like to introduce you to the speaker of, of the day, uh, Joel Blanchard. Uh, Joel did, he, did his grad uh, uh, research at the uh, Scripps Research Institute with Professor Kristin Baldwin, um, working on stem cell research in the context of uh, neuronal reprogramming. And after that, he moved uh, to the lab of uh, Lee Hu Tsai at MIT, where he kept his interest in uh, stem cell uh, research and reprogramming. In this case, applied, applied to the blood-brain barrier and uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and just to mention that he currently has a position as an independent research at uh, uh, Mount, uh, Mount Sinai in uh, New York. Uh, so with this, I will just uh, I'll let the speaker start uh, his presentation. Thank you, Javier, for the, the kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. And um, although virtually I, I share some of the, the data that we, we recently um, published and an un, unpublished story, um, and also then to, to meet with a, a bunch of people and, and discuss some of the, the challenges of doing research in these, these times. So I'll, I'll tell you two stories today. One of that's published, as I mentioned, about the effects of an AD risk factor in the blood-brain barrier. And then I'll tell you another unpublished story um, about how the same risk factor affects another tissue, myelinate, myelinated axons, and how that might also predispose people to Alzheimer's disease. I'll start with a just a, a, a some background to, to give you a broader context of the, the type of research that I do. And that, that's the slide here. Um, so most of us will live cognitively normal lives into our 80s and 90s, but unfortunately about one in 10 of us will experience cognitive impairments starting in around 65 to 70 years of age. 
And women are about two times more likely to have cognitive impairments than men are. And currently this is a um, quite a big problem. If you look at the most prevalent form of, of dementia or uh, Alzheimer's disease, it's estimated about 5 million Americans currently have Alzheimer's disease. And this is really a, a growing problem. Um, by the year 2050, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease is estimated to triple um, to about 16 million people. When we, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, we're really talking about two separate diseases. There's an early onset Alzheimer's disease that affects people starting in their 40s and 50s. And for, for early onset Alzheimer's disease, the genetics is really well understood. There are mutations in the genes that process or encode amyloid protein. And this is really what drives early onset Alzheimer's disease. But for the, the vast majority, nearly 95% of Alzheimer's disease, for the age of onset's about age 65. And we really don't understand the, the genetic um, underpinnings. And, and currently we have really no effective therapies. We do have some clues as to what is driving the, the um, Alzheimer's disease through genome-wide association studies or, or GWAS studies. And for instance, if you look at um, the, this loci here, APOE, it's one of the strongest um, risk factors or, or genetic correlates of Alzheimer's disease. And I'll, I'll be talking predominantly about this risk factor because it's found in, in approximately 60% of late onset Alzheimer's disease cases. And so to dive into it a little bit more, the, the humans um, have three common variants of the APOE gene that you can inherit from your mother or your father. And the, the most common form is called APOE3. And this has a, a neutral effect on Alzheimer's disease. But a, a single nucleotide polymorphism um, or a single amino acid change creates a, a, a variant called APOE4 that I'll, I'll talk more about. And if you receive have one copy of this, your risk for having Alzheimer's disease is three, time, three to five times greater. If you have two copies of this, you have nearly tw 10 to 12 fold increase um, in risk of Alzheimer's disease. And I won't talk about APOE2, but this is also a single nucleotide change from APOE3. And um, this has a protective effect against Alzheimer's disease. So I think this really, this bi-directional risk and protection effect really illustrates the importance of this loci or gene in Alzheimer's disease. What's really striking about APOE4 is it's a risk factor. You can be homozygous or have two copies of APOE4, but uh, you can live a cognitively normal life into your 80s and 90s and, and never experience Alzheimer's disease. And so this really suggests that the genetics of Alzheimer's disease might be polygenic, that APOE4 needs to act in conjunction with other risk factors to have a pathogenic effect, or that APO, um, there are unknown resilience factors that protect against Alzheimer's disease if you have a APOE4. But this not clearly understanding the, the genetics that really drives Alzheimer's disease has led us to, and the, the long, um, nearly decades that it takes to develop Alzheimer's disease or the, the course of the pathology has really caused our, our therapeutic approaches to focus on the late stage symptoms. So when people start to present with, with cognitive impairments, we start to provide therapeutics. And right now, the, the best therapeutics we have are really targeting the, the major symptoms of the disease, the amyloid buildup. But through understanding how the genetics contribute to this increased risk and start to drive the disease pathogenesis, we might be able to identify earlier interventions um, that are genetically informed. That it, um, So a lot of my focus of my research is trying to understand what these genetic factors do or what lifestyle differences such as dietary impacts do to, to contribute to Alzheimer's disease. And over the past few years, we've um, got some insight into this by looking into the brains of um, Alzheimer's disease patients and comparing them to normal patients using single cell transcriptomics um, profiling. And this has really been able, um, this is a paper published by my postdoc mentor, Liu Wei Sai in 2019. And we've been able to identify single um, gene expression changes in, in different cell types that correlate with Alzheimer's disease. But these gene expression changes are really at the end of, of life. And um, 
So we know how, how the, each cell type in the postmortem brain ends up or at the end of Alzheimer's disease. But taking these um, gene association studies and uh, end of life gene expression profiles at single cell resolution, um, it's a long ways from understanding how we can use these two pair, combine these two pieces of information into therapeutic approaches because we don't know if these are just things that correlate with the, the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And we don't know the order of events. Is this the last thing that happens or, or does it really drive the, the, the disease pathogenesis? And one of the analogies I like to use to, to explain this situation is it's similar to a plane crash where we observe, where um, investigators observe that the wing is broken off the plane, but they don't know if the wing broke off because the plane crashed or the plane crashed because the wing broke off, or the, because the wing broke off. And what's really helped um, investigators understand um, plane crashes is, is uh, the black box or the on-flight recorder. And so really to summarize my, my postdoc studies, it's really been trying to build an on-flight recorder by combining stem cell biology, neuroscience, and tissue engineering with single cell tr transcriptomics to understand um, Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis by, uh, by playing and replaying the pathogenesis in vitro using um, um, tissue-based models. Um, and I'll, to illustrate this more, I'll, I'll tell you two different stories about the, the blood-brain barrier and the myelination of how we're, we're building models of the human brain in a dish to dissect the mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I'll start with the, the blood-brain barrier story and give a, a brief background on that. The human brain, it's a highly vascularized organ. It's estimated if you stretch out all the capillaries in the human brain, they'd span approximately 400 miles. And every neuron is in an intimate interaction with the, the, the brain vasculature. And unlike the peripheral vasculature, the, the cerebral vasculature forms this specialized barrier that really not only delivers oxygen and nutrients to the brain, but protects it from peripheral insults. And so it's really emerged over the past few years that Alzheimer's disease might uh, emerge, uh, emerge because the blood-brain barrier breaks down and the, the the neurons and stuff aren't getting enough oxygen and nutrients and pathogens are infiltrating the brain. And so the, the blood brain barrier is really composed of, of three separate cell types, the endothelial cells, pericytes and astrocytes, which extend specialized and, and feed onto the, the capillaries. And so we want to know if we could recapitulate this blood brain barrier in vitro so that we could understand how AD genetics influences it, its susceptibility to pathology. And so we started by taking human iPS cells and optimizing differentiation protocols for each of the cell types, brain endothelial cells, pericytes, and astrocytes. And on the right here is just representative images for each of the, the three cell types. Um, and we went a little bit further. We want to make sure that at a transcriptomics level that what we were making <clears throat> in a dish actually reflected what was in the human brain. So we isolate, use single cell transcriptomics to isolate each of the cell types from the, the human brain. And then this allowed us to compare the, the whole transcriptome of our IPS derived, for example, pericytes to in vivo human brain pericytes. And what we observed is that the IPS derived pericytes had a high degree of similarity to the in vivo human brain pericytes um, and were, were significantly different from other cell types such as smooth muscle cells, astrocytes and microglia. And so this suggests that the cells that we were making in a dish might have some predictive fidelity about what's going on in the, the human brain. So we're interested in how a tissue um, is affected during Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. So we tried to make a, a tissue-based model by encapsulating all three of these cell types in, into a hydrogel matrix, which allows them to interact and self-assemble. And after a period of about four weeks, what we observed is that the endothelial cells stained here with the cadherin shown in green actually formed tube networks that were reminiscent of, of micro vessels in the, in the brain. And what was even more interesting is in, when we initially put the pericytes into the, the culture, they were homogeneously dispersed, um, but the endothelial cells were known to secrete a growth factor, PDGFBB, 
And so even after about two weeks, we start to start the, the parasites or neural cells to start to line the, the capillaries in this in vitro culture system. And we've started similar things with, with astrocytes, just trying to verify that the model system has anatomical properties of the, the blood brain barrier in vivo. And so astrocytes localize end feed, as I mentioned, and on those end feed are specialized uh, transporters for regulating water volume in the brain or, or other um, solutes. And what we observed in the in vitro blood brain barrier or IBVB is that aquaporin-4 was expressed in, in our, our model system and largely localized in, on astrocytic end feed along the, the in vitro vasculature. And so we've done a lot of studies like these and I won't go through them all because the, the work's published, but um, essentially we think we can um, mimic certain anatomical, molecular and physiological properties of the blood brain barrier in vitro. And we're really interested in, in applying this model to disease. And so we're interested in Alzheimer's disease and one of the um, primary cerebral vascular pathologies in Alzheimer's disease is this pathology called cerebral amyloid angiopathy or CAA. And what that is, is amyloid building up along the, the capillaries and, and, and uh, vasculature in the human brain shown here in blue. And it's estimated that about 95% of Alzheimer's disease patients have CAA pathology. And so we wanted to know if we could model CAA using our, our in vitro system. And the, we did a, a bunch of studies to show that the, the cerebral vasculature doesn't produce a lot of amyloid. And it's really known that the amyloid in the brain comes from neurons. So what we did is a, a conditioned media experiment where we took NPCs, allowed them to differentiate into neuron and glia, and then collected the media and put it on our IBV. And using a, a um, patient-derived IPS or NPCs, we could take NPCs from a, a healthy person that has low amyloid in the conditioned media. And when we did that, we observed that there wasn't a lot of amyloid immune or activity along the vasculature shown in, in green here. When we took um, conditioned media from NPCs from a um, an familial AD patient that has high amyloid, what we observed is that there was a lot of amyloid immune reactivity or buildup along the, the vasculature shown here in green. And so th this suggests that we can model aspects of this pathology using our in vitro, in vitro system. And so the, the next thing we really wanted to ask is whether we can model um, the genetic susceptibility for, for CAA in a dish. And as, as I mentioned, ApoE4 is a risk factor for a AD, but it's also a risk factor for CAA. Um, and so to ask this question, we, we use CRISPR editing to generate isogenic sets of IPS cells that either have their homozygous for E3 or nearly identical IPS cells that are homozygous for E4. We differentiated them into the, the three vascular cell types per, um, and then encapsulated them into the, the hydrogel matrix, allowed it to mature for a couple of weeks, and then exposed it again to a high amyloid environment and asked if there were differences between the E3 and E4. And really encouragingly, what we saw is when we took these genetically identical IBBBs, the E3 again had you know, some amyloid building up along the, the vasculature, but the ApoE4 um, IBBB just had a, a ton more amyloid building up along the, the vasculature. And so to make a, a long story short, we've done this, we did this experiment multiple different ways. Here I'm showing um, using two different CRISPR editing strategies. We can edit the non-risk E3 into an E4, or we can do the reverse, edit a, another iPS cell line of, that has ApoE4 into an E3. And regardless of the, the editing strategy, consistently we saw if you have two copies of ApoE4, this leads to a high amyloid state. And we've done this with non-edited lines that are heterozygous and found that even one copy of ApoE4 is sufficient to significantly increase the, the vascular amyloid um, accumulation, which is reflective of what's seen in, in the clinic. And so we're able to model this, C, this fat cerebral vascular pathology in a dish. We wanted to know if we can use this model to start to dissect what are the, the key cellular and molecular events that are driving this. And so the, the first question that came to mind was, is ApoE4 required to be expressed in all of the cell types to drive this pathology or is it only some of them? And so 
what we're able to do with this engineered model system is what we call an isogenic um, mix and match experiment. We can, I'm sure we can express ApoE3 in all of the, the cell types or ApoE4 in all the cell types, but we can do everything in between. We can have um, each combination of ApoE3, ApoE4, either pairwise or singular. <clears throat> and so there's eight permutations. We made all eight permutations and that allowed them to mature and then expose them to high levels of amyloid again. What we observed is that, again, the all ApoE3 had low amyloid buildup, the all ApoE4 had high amyloid buildup, but then the, the different combinations had different levels of, of amyloid. So we quantified all the amyloid and basically asked which combinations are similar to the, the all E3 state and which combinations are similar to the all E4 state. And to summarize this more, more graphically, essentially what we found is that if pericytes express ApoE4, this consistently led to a low amyloid state. I'm sorry, express ApoE3, this consistently led to a low amyloid state. And if pericytes express ApoE4, this consistently led to a high amyloid state. And so this and a, and a handful of other experiments that we, we did really suggest that the expression of ApoE4 in pericytes, it plays a causal role in the increased va cerebral vascular amyloid accumulation. And so we were able to pinpoint the, the pericyte, but we, then we wanted to dig into the, the molecular mechanisms underlying this more. And first we wanted to know whether it's the physical interaction of the pericyte with the, the vasculature, or is it um, something that is secreted by the pericyte? Um, so we, for this experiment, we did um, basically another conditioned media experiment, only this time using parasite conditioned media, reasoning that if, if it's a soluble factor, that peri the ApoE4 parasites would be able to drive up cerebral vascular amyloid accumulation in the, the ApoE3 IBV. And that's the, what we found is that if we expose the ApoE3 IBV to parasite E3 parasite conditioned media, this doesn't lead to an increased amyloid accumulation. But if we expose the E3 IBV to a uh, ApoE4 parasite conditioned media, this leads to increased amyloid accumulation. So this suggests that, that it, ApoE4 parasites are secreting a soluble factor. And so to really get it, an idea of what that soluble factor is, we did RNA sequencing to compare gene expression profiles of isogenic ApoE3 parasites and ApoE4 parasites. And we were shocked to see that there is dramatic gene expression differences between um, ApoE3 and ApoE4. It's, it's only one amino acid change and there are nearly 2000 genes upregulated in ApoE4 parasites and 2000 genes downregulated in ApoE4 parasites. So there's a lot of data to sift through here. But what really struck out to us is that in ApoE4 parasites, the expression of ApoE itself was upregulated nearly twofold. And this is, was particularly interesting because ApoE is known to be a secreted protein so it's a soluble factor, plus it's known to interact with, with amyloid. So we hypothesized that this increase in ApoE expression might be driving the, the pathology itself. And so we wanted to make sure that this wasn't just an artifact of our IPS-derived parasites and some, some in vitro observation that we're making. So we went to human brain slices um, from the, the hippocampus. And what we observe when we stain for the vasculature and parasites along the vasculature is brain hippo hippocampus from ApoE4 carriers had dramatically increased ApoE expression relative to non-ApoE4 carriers in, in parasites. So this suggests that in, in the human brain, ApoE4 parasites have increased ApoE expression. And so we've done an, a number, I won't go into all of this, this data here, but we've done a number of experiments to demonstrate that, that ApoE, increased ApoE expression has a causal role in, in increased um, amyloid accumulation. So we've used a, a CRISPR knockout strategy and found if you knock out ApoE, this reduces vascular amyloid accumulation. If you immunodeplete ApoE using antibodies, this reduces cerebral vascular amyloid accumulation. And if you do the reverse, you add in recombinant ApoE, this dramatically increases the, the cerebral vascular ApoE um, accumulation. So this really suggests it's, it's the levels of ApoE 
that are driving the, the vascular amyloid accumulation. And so we know that pericyte, ApoE4 pericytes are secreting more ApoE. Um, and so if we can determine how they're secreting or why they're secreting more ApoE and suppress this pathway, we might be able to reduce the, the vascular amyloid accumulation. And so the, the next question that we focused on is why is ApoE upregulated in ApoE4 pericytes? And so we went back to this transcriptome or RNA sequencing data set, and we reasoned it was really a, a transcription factor mediated event that's upright, leading to upregulation of ApoE and ApoE4 parasites. So we isolated all the, the transcription factors. And there are nearly 100 downregulated transcription factors by ApoE4 and 100 upregulated transcription factors in ApoE4 parasites. But we asked if any of these transcription factors had been reported or known to bind ApoE regulatory elements. And in, in fact, two classes of transcription factors really stuck out. The CEBPs and NFAT pathways were both differentially upregulated in ApoE4 parasites. So just to make sure this wasn't an in vitro artifact, we also looked in the, the human brain and, and post more um, hippocampal parasites. And what we found there, again, is that in ApoE4, and parasites from ApoE4 carriers, NFAT C1 and NFAT C2 were both upregulated compared to non-carriers. So this demonstrates that in ApoE4 carriers, there's upregulated NFAT, which we hypothesize could be driving increased ApoE expression. And so to test this, we had to learn a little bit about the, the NFAT pathway. And so NFAT in an inact inactive state resides in the phosph in the cytosol because it's phosphorylated. And when this pathway becomes activated, a phosphatase called calcineurin actually cleaves off the phosphate, which allows NFAT to translocate to the nucleus, where we are hypothesizing it interacts with regulatory elements of ApoE, allowing its upregulation. And so there are well-established inhibitors of calcineurin, um, cyclosporin A and FK506, that can um, block the removal of the phosphate and the nuclear translocation of, of ApoE. And so we treated the parasites with this, I mean, with cyclosporin A and FK506. And encouragingly, what we found is that when we treat ApoE4 parasites with cyclosporin or FK506, not shown here, this dramatically reduces the ApoE expression. And um, the, sorry, the animations were a bit messed up, but we also treated the in vitro cultures with this reasoning if ApoE expression is downregulated, this will lead to a removal of, of amyloid. And so in the control IBB, we see a lot of this green staining, which is the, the amyloid buildup. But when we treat the IBB with cyclosporin FK506, then apply the amyloid, less amyloid builds up on the ApoE4 IBB. So suggesting that inhibiting this pathway can block cerebral vascular amyloid accumulation. We're really excited that we could do this in a culture dish, but the real goal is to, to translate this to a, a living organism and, and into humans. And so we immediately moved to a, to a mouse model where the, the mouse ApoE has been removed and replaced with human ApoE. And um, the mice are crossed to an AD model called the 5X FAD mouse. And at six months of age, these mice develop CEA pathology. And so we, we treated these mice either with a vehicle uh, control or 10 mg per keg of FK506 and, or cyclosporin for three weeks through interperitoneal injections and then quantified the, the vascular amyloid accumulation. And what we observed is that in the control mice, um, the vascular here is sure is stained in, in red and the amyloid stained in green, is that the control mice had robust um, vascular amyloid accumulation, but in mice treated with, with cyclosporin CSA or FK506, there was a significant reduction in the vascular amyloid accumulation, suggesting that um, treating a whole organism with these drugs can reduce cerebral vascular amyloid accumulation.
So we were particularly excited about these, these results because both cyclospore RNA and FK506 are used clinically um, as immunosuppressants post-organ transplant. And there have been some anecdotal studies that have looked at these populations of, of, of people and observed that they have lower incidence of dementia than the, the general population. So for example, the, here the general population has about a at age 65 has about a 10% incidence of dementia, whereas people on calcineurin inhibitors have about a 1%. And similar trends continue all the way up to age 35, 85, sorry, where the 30% of the general population has dementia, whereas people on these drugs have a, a 0% chance of dementia or incidence. But these drugs have pretty adverse side effects. They're, they're immunosuppressive, so the people that are taking them are at high risk for infection and, and cancer and, and other side effects. So we wanted to know if we titrated down the dose of, of these drugs, do we still see um, improvements in the pathological outcomes in, in mice? And so we ran this titration experiment where we treated again the mice with a vehicle or 10 mg per keg of, of, of FK506 one mg per keg or 0.1 mg per keg. And this time, instead of just analyzing the, the brain for pathology, we also collected peripheral organs such as the spleen and the, the blood to see if we, to monitor whether the doses we were applying to the, the mice was immunosuppressive. And so just to give an example of this, in the, in the spleen, which is, has a lot of B and T cells localized to it, when we applied 10 mg per keg of, of FK506, we saw our significant suppression of IL-2 and TNF-alpha, which are both immune response genes. And so repression of these genes suggests that the drugs are acting as an immunosuppressant. And we see similar results at one mg per kg that IL-2 and TNF-alpha are both repressed. But at, at 0.1 mg per kilogram, we don't see a significant difference between um, the control mice that didn't receive um, FK506. So this suggests that at 0.1 mg per kg, that um, FK506 is not acting in an immunosuppressive manner. And so th this was encouraging, but then we also wanted to know if this led to a reduction in the, the cerebral vascular amyloid pathology. And so um, encouragingly, even at um, one mg per kg, we see significant reductions in the, the amyloid building up along the vasculature. It's not as, as robust as the, the higher doses, but still it's significantly reduced. And so this is great that we can reduce the, the pathology in a mouse um, brain, but the, the ultimate goal is to improve cognitive abilities of, of mice. And so recently we've done some studies to find that even this, this sub-immunosuppressive dose of, of FK506 can lead to improved um, tasks associated with learning and memory. And so we, we took the uh, two cohorts, again, a control treated mouse and a FK506 mouse and treated them with daily IP injections for six weeks. And then we did blinded behavioral studies on, on these mice led by a talented uh, behavioral postdoc in, in Liwei Sai's lab, Taeyoon Kim. And I'll just give you one example, of, one example of a test that we ran, the novel object re recognition test. And basically, if, if you're not familiar with this, this test, you place a mouse in a cage where there's two objects that are identical, and you, you allow them to get familiar with these objects for about 10 minutes, and you place them back in the home cage, and then you put them in a, a cage where one of the objects has been removed and replaced with a novel object. And the, the thought here is that mice like to explore. And so if they find the novel object, they'll spend more, they'll have a preference for exploring the new, the novel object opposed to the familiar object. And so mice that aren't able to distinguish whether it's novel or familiar have a preference of about 50%. And so the control mice had a preference of about 50%, but the mice treated with the the FK506 showed improved ability to, re to recognize the, the novel object and had a significant um, difference of about 60% discrimination index. And so we've run a, a number of tests like this, including the, the Y maze, the Morris water maze, and we're continuing to do these studies. But consistently, um, 
APOE4 AD mice treated with low doses of FK506 are, are showing improvements in tasks associated with learning and memory. And so we're, we're excited to move forward with these results. And so I'll just summarize this project um, really quickly and say that we were able to reconstruct aspects of the, the human cerebral vasculature in a dish and then use it to model a pathology associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And that allowed us to, to identify the, the causal cell, a molecular mechanism, and a, a way to suppress that molecular mechanism that has now been able to um, lead to a cognitive improvements in, in animal models. And so um, that most of that story was, was published in, in Nature Medicine earlier this, this year. So if I went through it um, fairly quickly, please ask questions at the, at the end or, or feel free to look at the, the publication. But next, I'd like to move on to a, another story that, that's um, currently in preparation. And this story really focuses on myelination. And so myelination is this um, thick lipid layer, cholesterol rich and lipid layer that wraps around axons. And this is really important for supporting axons and improving electrical conductance. And um, my, uh, myelination is, is conducted by oligodendrocytes which um, arise from a, a long lineage of cells from oligodendrocyte progenitors, immature oligodendrocytes, non-myelinating mature oligodendrocytes, and then myelinating mature oligodendrocytes. In a, a recent study by um, Constilo Black Bronco, um, recently using single cell transcriptomics, identified that immature oligodendrocytes and, and early progenitors actually express APOE at high levels and can be identified in the oligodendrocyte lineage through their, their high levels of expression. Um, and for a long time, it's, it's also been known that in Alzheimer's disease and dementia, um, there is reduced myelination. So this is a, a really old paper, but it's using a, a stain called Luxol Fast Blue, and it stains for lipid-rich myelinated areas in the brain. You can see in the healthy, there's much darker staining, but in moderate dementia, there's much, much lighter staining. So it, suggesting that um, for some reason, myelin breaks down in the Alzheimer's disease brain. And more, more recently, a single, single cell transcriptomic study from Liwei Sai's group, where, where I did my postdoc, compared the postmortem single cells from the um, prefrontal cortex, Broadman area 10, um, from people that had no AD pathology to people that had AD pathology. And they isolated a bunch of different cells and identified the, the clusters, which I had mentioned in the, the intro. But one of the, the really striking things about this data set is if you zoomed into the, the oligodendrocyte cluster, the oligodendrocytes from AD patients formed this really unique cluster that was significantly different from oligodendrocytes from healthy individuals. And so this dem suggests that AD oligodendrocytes or oligodendrocytes in the AD brain have a unique transcriptional signature. Um, and so more recently working with um, a talented postdoc in Manolas Kalas's lab, Jose Davala, uh, grad student Juna and, and Leila, We've been looking at single cell transcriptomics data comparing people that have AD risk, the AD risk factor APOE4 to people that don't have the, the AD risk factor APOE4. And this data, we've looked both in the, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, but I'll show you the data from the, the hippocampus here where um, looking at oligodendrocytes from APOE4 carriers, we see significant dif expression differences in, in genes. What really stuck out here is that a number of myelin-associated genes, PLP1, MAG, MOG, and myelin basic protein, were significantly downregulated in oligodendrocytes from APOE4 carriers. And if you run all the, the downregulated genes through a, a GEO analysis, what sticks out is that there's basically two branches from, of the genes. You have 
path biological pathways and neuronal differentiation and maturation. But the other branch is really focused on myelination and oligodendrocyte differentiation. <clears throat> so this suggests that in human oligodendrocytes, ApoE4 um, downregulates um, myelin-associated pathways. <clears throat> and so humans are, are pretty diverse or genetically diverse. So we wanted to do a, a more controlled study. So we looked at at the ApoE knock-in mice again, where the, the mouse ApoE has been knocked out and replaced with either ApoE3 or ApoE4. And so this will, would allow us to specifically test the role of ApoE4 in myelination. And the, the classic study for looking at myelination is, is TEM or transmission electron microscopy. So we took out the, the corpus callosum from, from these mice and compared it um, the alter structure of the of the myelin sheaths in, in the two different mice strains or mice with the two different genotypes. And so in the if you haven't looked at these images before, these um, blank spots here are basically the barrel of the axon and it, it's proceeding perpendicular to the, the plane of focus. But around the axon are these electron dense areas shown in black. And those are really the, the myelin leaflets. And what really stuck out to us is that in the ApoE3 mice, there's nice um, black myelin leaflets that increase with age. But in the ApoE4 mice, the, the myelin leaf leaflets are more sparse and appear um, more disorganized. And so the, the classical way of, of quantifying this is using something called a, a G ratio, which, take, which takes the axonal diameter to the outer myelin diameter. And so it's a, it's a bit of a weird number where one equals no myelination. And there have been some theoretical studies that have shown 0.6 equals optimal myelination. And so it, just quantifying these images, are, they're qualitatively different. But if you look at uh, the ApoE3 mouse, it has a, a mean G ratio of about 0.6, which is near optimal myelination. But the ApoE4 mice tend more towards um, one, which is, is lower levels of myelination. And so this really, and some additional human data that I don't have time to, to show you, really suggested to us that ApoE4 promotes hypomyelination relative to ApoE3. And we want to know, dig into this a little bit more and understand what, what's going on here. Why does ApoE4 act? to reduce myelination. And so to do this, I, we turn back to our in vitro model systems that are, allow us to control variables and mix and match genotypes a little bit more clearly. And so um, here to build an in vitro model system of myelination, what I did is differentiated the iPS cells into oligodendroglia or OPC-like cells and differentiated the same iPS cells into to neurons in a different dish then mix them together in a hydrogel, allow them to interact for a, over a period of time. What we started to see <clears throat> is after about two weeks, the oligodendrocytes um, were expanding through the culture and starting to engage um, the axon shown in red and the green stain here is, is MPP staining. And after about six weeks, we, we saw see that the axons start to have, the oligodendrocytes start to have or sorry, the culture started to have these periodic stains that might be reminiscent of the, the nodes of Ranvia in, in, viv in vivo. And then we've done some TEM imaging on these cultures and we see the, the um, classical um, axon barrels with uh, leaflets of membrane wrapping around them. This was, since we established this model system, we want to go back to our isogenic pairs of ApoE3 and ApoE4 um, and this time see if we can model differences in myelination in a dish that we'd seen in the, in, in the, the mouse model. And encouragingly what we saw is when we looked at um, ApoE3 uh, oligodendroglia and ApoE4 neurons, we see a lot of my, um, MVP staining that is starting to engage neuronal axons shown in, in red here. But in the ApoE4 case, we don't see a lot of, of um, MVP staining along the, the axonal tracks. And since we were able to model this in, in, in a dish, we wanted to ask 
similar to what we did with the, the mixing and matching in the, the blood brain barrier is if, um, if we could pinpoint which cell type was playing a causal role here. And I'll, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll show you a simplified schematic where we took ApoE3 oligodendroglia and co-cultured them with ApoE3 neurons, ApoE4 oligodendroglia co-cultured with ApoE3 neurons, where we also included a ApoE knockout co-cultured with ApoE3 neurons. So the only thing here changing is the, the oligodendroglia cells. What we observed um, in, in these cultures is the ApoE3 um, at around three weeks had nice foci of MBP positive areas throughout the culture, but the ApoE4 and, ApoE, and the ApoE knockout, we didn't see a lot of these foci developing. And after about six weeks, the ApoE3 culture is, is nicely, um, a lot of the axons are, are coated with MBP, whereas in the ApoE4 culture and the knockout culture, mm -hmm. Things are a little bit more disorganized and the expression of MVP is, is much lower. We've quantified this um, at six weeks and we see a significant difference in, in MVP localized to axons between, um, between the ApoE3 and the ApoE4 case. They're significantly, ApoE4 leads to significantly reduced um, MVP axonal staining. And in, in this experiment, just to remind you, it, the only thing that varied was the oligodendroglia. So this suggests that the oligodendroglia have a cell autonomous defect that's uh, preventing them from uh, myelinating properly or, or MVP co-localizing to the axons. And so to dig into this more again, then we moved to the, the molecular analysis and, and RNA sequencing. And this, this analysis was done by a talented grad student in Liwei Sai's lab, Audrey Effenberger. And she looked at, she found a, a number of differentially regulated genes um, in the RNA-seq data. But a lot of these genes, similar to the, the stuff that we were seeing in the human brain, were myelin-associated genes, such as PLP1, C, C and PASS, and, and myelin um, regulatory factor. So suggesting that in ApoE4 oligodendroglia, these, these genes are downregulated. But when we looked at the upregulated genes, what, what really stuck out to us is that um, cholesterol biosynthesis pathways were, were nearly uniformly upregulated in apo, ApoE4 oligodendroglia. And so just to zoom on, zoom into this pathway a little bit more, what I'll show you is this is the, the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And nearly every enzyme in this pathway is significantly high, more highly expressed in ApoE4 oligodendrocytes or oligodendroglia. And so th this was really exciting, suggesting that, that for, for whatever reason, ApoE4 oligodendroglia are producing more cholesterol. And around the same time, uh, we made this observation, Jose and Juna were analyzing postmortem brains from ApoE4 carriers. And they, they came to the, the same observation that if you look at oligodendrocytes in the human brain from ApoE4 carriers, the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway is significantly upregulated when you have one copy of ApoE4 and for even more when you have two copies of ApoE4. These are the same en enzymes that we're seeing in our in vitro culture system. So we're, and um, Jose has gone on to analyze this data a little bit more using geo analysis or gene ontology analysis. And it, it really points to a disruption in cholesterol transport and biosynthesis in ApoE4 oligodendrocytes in the human brain. And so then to start to understand this, this data a little bit more, we went back to the in vitro models and asked if we could under, see where the, the cholesterol is actually localizing. And we thought that perhaps ApoE4 is leading to a mislocalization of, of cholesterol. So we used a stain, different stains called Bodipi cholesterol or Philippin that, that stain for, for, for cholesterol in the cells. And it's really strikingly what we observed is that in ApoE4 oligodendroglia in vitro, we see large amounts of, of, of cholesterol accumulating intercellularly, for, perhaps in a lysosome or ER, um, suggesting that ApoE4 oligodendroglia are 
are unable to transport or efflux cholesterol as efficiently as, as E3 oligodendroglia. And so there have been drugs um, such as, as cyclo cyclodextrin, which can help solubilize and dissolve cholesterol and lipid droplets, and intracellular cholesterol and lipid droplets. So we reasoned that we might be able to solubilize cholesterol and, and reduce these cholesterol droplets in, in the cell using the, the cyclodextrin, which has previously been reported to. And encouragingly, when we treated the ApoE4 oligodendroglia with cyclodextrin for about a week, we saw that there was a significant reduction in intracellular cholesterol accumulation in ApoE4 oligodendroglia. And so next we want to know if, if you reduce intracellular cholesterol, does this lead to an increased myelination in, in our vitro systems? And so we, we similar to the, the, the previous experimental par paradigms, we took ApoE3 OPCs with ApoE3 neurons or ApoE4 OPCs with ApoE3 neurons, but this time treated with a, a, a vehicle or cyclodextrin. And in the control treated ones, we didn't see much myelin foci around four weeks, but in the cyclodextrin, we started to see myelin foci starting to, to emerge around three weeks. And encouragingly, after about six weeks, we, we saw um, more significant um, MBP axonal al alignment than, than we did in the, the control ApoE4 um, co-cultures. It, it wasn't a, a complete rescue back to the ApoE3 state, but the, it suggests that, that cholesterol um, uh, mistranslocate transport or, or in, impairments in efflux of cholesterol in the ApoE4 oligodendroglia do in part um, suppress MBP axonal engagement in, in the ApoE4 case. So I, I'd just like to summarize the, this study here where we've identified that ApoE4 um, impacts oligodendroglia and in, in this case, it, it behaves similar to a, a knockout of ApoE, so suggesting that it's a loss of function. And we've been able to identify that ApoE4 impairs cholesterol and lipid transport in oligodendroglia. And this correlates with the reduced myelination phenotype. And just to summarize the, the previous work I said um, presented, ApoE4 in the cerebral vasculature appears to act upon a cell called the pericyte. And in this case, it, it seems to act a bit differently where ApoE itself, ApoE4 is a gain of a toxic function that leads to increased ApoE around the vasculature and increased vascular amyloid accumulation. And so I think this, these two stories really highlight the complexities of, of targeting a, a single genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It, it doesn't seem that uh, it has a, a single role pathogenic mechanism, but um, through each different tissue acts, has, acts quite differently. And so the therapeutic approaches need to take, take this into account. So I'll just summarize with this slide. Um, my research is really focused on trying to understand how, why some people develop, um, live cognitively normal lives in their eighties and nineties and, and, um, Others, for either genetic or dietary or other lifestyle factors, develop cognitive impairments. And so the, the model systems or the approach that I use is really an intersection between stem cell biology, neuroscience, tissue engineering, and, and single cell transcriptomics. So I hope I've been able to illustrate these approaches um, today. So I'd just like to thank um, all the people that are involved in this work, and in particular, Professor Liu Sai, who's been a, a tremendous um, supportive mentor, Manolis Kellis, um, who's been, um, who's led the, the single cell work, and, and Jose Davala, who's the postdoc in, in Manolis Kellis's lab, and a bunch of other very talented people that have um, contributed to to these projects and their success. So I just want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please let me know.